Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Worship is indeed a great privilege to be invited to come into God's presence and to worship Him. And if we're honest, and if we understand the revelation of God's Word, we realize how inadequate we are to do that. And a salvation experience only gives us the potential to worship Him. No, we see in the Torah and throughout the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, we see patterns, we see examples of revelation in order to give us insight. But remember what Yeshua said. There is a time coming when the Father will require that those who worship Him, worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that day has come. And when we look at passages that we began last week and will continue this week from the book of Exodus in chapter 25, I've mentioned to you that last week we began this section that will go for many chapters about insight for worshiping God, for having a heavenly experience in this body and in this world. That's what worship potentially what it was intended to do for us, to give us a kingdom experience. And worship, when it's done to honor God, it is extremely, extremely impactful in our life. I may have said this before, but I was listening to an individual, and this individual said, we want our worship experience to produce this, that you make good decisions and that you'll have less amount of things to regret. Now, in one sense, that's, that's good, but that's not what worship is about. See, the problem is this. When I say I'm coming to worship God so that I will make good decisions, and we all want to make God-honoring decisions, and we don't want to do things that we're going to regret. Obviously, that's correct. But worship is not about us. It is about God. And I assure you that if we really want to make good decisions and have fewer regrets, then the best way, the best way is to experience anointed worship. And the only way, and I want to emphasize this, the only way to experience anointed worship is to understand what the Word of God says about worship. And we have began last week a journey when we're going to encounter Scripture to give us more and more insight. Now, here's the problem. We tend, I'll make it personal, I tend to be impatient. I don't like a piece here and a piece there I want the whole thing. But realize so many things that are worthwhile in a person's life takes time. We have to build it. And that building it can also be a life-changing experience. It impacts our life. It forms us who we are in Messiah. So there's a temptation to, to look at the scripture and take it beyond where this text goes because we're going to be looking at two other instruments instruments vessels what some would call tabernacle furniture and I'm speaking specifically of the the shulchan lechem hapanim the table for the showbread and for the menorah the the golden menorah that lampstand and the scripture gives us a lot of information about 
these vessels, these instruments. But here's the problem. It is, in our discipline studied, and that's what it is, it is a study that we're trying to manifest discipline. Allow the Word of God to speak to us. Now, you may say, you know what? I came away from this study, and I really didn't find anything to encourage me that impacted me. That's okay. Because sometimes, in fact, I believe that this should be the norm, not the exception. But we encounter the Word of God, both cognitive, but also that inner man, that inner woman. And we can have a life-changing experience and not even know it. Because this Word, it can penetrate our inner being. This word can change us. It is anointed. So we might not say, wow, this was so exciting. I learned so much. I found principles in this. Sometimes we simply need to digest that word and trust that that word will bring an interchange. And those interchanges is what's going to bring about the greatest outside changes in our life. So with that said, Take out your Bible. Look with me once more to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 25. We're going to, God willing, conclude this chapter and begin with verse 23. And we simply want to take the Scripture for what it reveals and not run to other places for additional biblical revelation concerning this. We'll allow the Word of God to reveal to us what He wants us to know in the timing that he has, according to scriptural order. Verse 23. Ve asita. And you shall make. And this speaks about, speaks first to Moses, but it speaks about Moses' responsibility. Who, achrai, he is responsible for this. So that's why God speaks directly to Moses. And he says, And you shall make, we'll learn later on, that there's other people involved. But Moses is responsible. He's the leader. And you shall make a table of atzei shittim. This is acacia wood. In the same way that we saw that the Aron Habrit, the Ark of the Covenant, It was made from acacia wood. So is this table. This table that we're speaking about, it says, you shall make it, this table, from acacia wood. And it gives the dimensions, very similar to the revelation concerning the ark. We read that its length is two cubits. The ark was two and a half. Its its width is one. The ark was one and a half. And the height is the same height, one and a half cubits. So we look at this table and we find its length, two cubits. It's width one and its height, one and a half cubits. Similarly to the ark of the covenant or the ark of testimony, look down to verse 24. And you shall cover it with pure gold. In the same way that the ark was covered with pure gold. Again, verse 24. And you shall cover it with pure gold. And you shall make for it, what it says here, zer. A zer is, many of the rabbinical scholars call it a a crown. And what it is, is a border but a decorative border. We'll see a difference in a moment between another portion of this this table and something similar. So you shall make a zer, this crown, like crown molding, which is usually decorative. And it also shall be of gold around. Verse 25. And you shall make for it 
This is referring to the shulchan, the table, but perhaps in a unique way, this, this, this crown, this molding, you shall make a border. And what most people are saying about this is that there's one framework that surrounds it, and then the zer sits on top of it, and this top portion is very decorative, whereby, whereby this mizgeret, and that's the Hebrew word, is simply a border to it. So you shall make for it a border of a, the word here is tofach, which is the measurement of a hand. Now, some will say it's this measurement. Others, I won't get into this, but it's, it's smaller, smaller than a cubic, certainly. So once more, you make this border, and we're told here that it's one uh, hand's width around. And you shall make the crown, this crown molding of gold for, and this shows the connection of one on top of another. You shall make it for the border around, verse 26. And you shall make for it, here again, probably for the table, four rings of gold, just like we saw, four rings on the Ark of the Covenant. What were for those four rings for? It's going to be the same thing for here. They assist in its transporting, it being moved. And, of course, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, was portable. So you shall make for it four rings of gold, and you shall set these rings upon the four corners, which are to the four legs. Now, what's unique here? A table is not like a, a aron, like the chest, but rather a table has legs. And obviously, this one has four legs, and on each of these legs, the quarter of them, they place these rings. And the purpose for them, as I said, is very similar. Look at verse 27. Opposite the border, there shall be the rings for, and therefore a house. Now, a house is something that one dwells in, and these so-called houses are for the bedin. The bedin is what we talked about as well last week. I mentioned another Hebrew word, mot, which is a pole. So a bod, in this case, is a pole that goes through the rings. They're placed upon two on one side, two on the other. So on each of the four legs, so these poles can transport. You lift up the shulchan, the table, for the lechem hapanim, the showbread, with these poles. It says at the end, to carry the table, just like we said, verse 28. And you shall make these poles of the same material of acacia wood, and you shall cover them with gold. And you lift up with them the table. So in the same way that to move the Ark of the Covenant, you had to use the poles. In the same way, you have to use the poles for the shulchan, the table of the showbread. Look at verse 29. Now, verse 29, we are somewhat dependent upon the sages because of the words here. Some we know, but how they're used in ancient Hebrew can be a little bit different than how they're used today. Move on to verse 29. And you shall make, and four things are being said here. We have the word for, word for like a bowl. Most believe that these bowls are what the lechem, the bread, is placed in. And then we have the kaftor, uh, kafotav. These, usually in modern Hebrew, it speaks about a spoon. And it may be what you remove, and most people believe this, remove the, the lechem, the bread, from the oven. And with this kapot, you, you place it upon the kara, which is the, the container that the lechem, the bread, sets in. 
And then you have two other things mentioned here. And this would be the shelves because, and if you see a picture, and maybe it would be good at this time that a picture would come up of the table of showbread. And you can see the shelves. So this is what the first word, or literally the third word here, but the first word of the last two, refers to the shelves. And then for there to be shelves, you have to have like a wall. These would be the pillars, the last word, where the, the shelves are attached to. So the lechem panim, the showbread, is stacked in a very precise way that you can see from the picture. Move on, second part of verse 29, which you shall cast or pour gold upon them, pure gold, in order to make them. So these things you make, but you pour pure gold over them in their making. And you set upon the table the showbread before me, before the Lord, always. So there's always going to be bread on this table. Now, traditionally, on Shabbat, new bread is brought in and the old bread is partaken of by the Kohanim, the priests. And according to tradition, each one would get only a small piece, but it would fill, satisfy in a very, very uh, uh, strong way. So we see miracles constantly as an outcome of worship. Well, let's move on to the second and final portion of our study tonight, and this includes the menorah. And the golden lampstand is of great importance. Not wanting to get ahead of myself, but realize that it is also made of pure gold, not of wood covered with gold, but pure gold like that mercy seat, the caporet, which God dwelt upon. And traditionally, we see biblical evidence for this as well that when one would see the light of the menorah, he was called to remember God's presence is with us. He's here in the holy city, in Jerusalem, in the holy of holies, but he's also everywhere. So this is one of the messages of the menorah. But notice in teaching this next section is, is difficult. There's many of the scholars that would relate to you that how this is being said it's hard to know that's why Betsael who was highly involved in making these things was a person who had a unique spirit in him that he could understand this revelation so realize we're going to go over this but it may seem confusing and that's why, according to the traditional views, you'll see some pictures come up as I go through this of the menorah. And it may surprise you, may surprise you how different it actually was from what we think and what we have seen and how uh, uh, carefully and intricately it was made. Let's move. Verse 31. Once again, and you shall make a golden menorah. And this gold is of pure gold. And then we have this word, niksha, which remember that same word appears in regard to the kruvim, the cherubim. That they're, they're made from a lump of gold and beat with a hammer into its shape. The entire menorah was made in this way. There was a, a gush, zahav, a gold lump. And with a hammer, the menorah in this fine, detail was made beaten into shape that's why it says you shall make a menorah gold of pure gold beaten you shall make the menorah and its stand and its branch and its cups and its buttons and its its flowers now that expression the reason why i said it in hebrew is because we need to understand what it's saying 
It is from it. They, all these things shall be. So we don't have these pieces that we assemble. That's the message we need to see here. The manure who uniquely relates to the revelation of God is not made in pieces. Hashem hu shalem, which means the Lord, he is complete. He doesn't comprise of things. He is. And this is what the manure is made of. One piece, one element. Not things being added or subtracted. You, you, you chisel something, a sculpture, and he has a lot of waste. No waste in the menorah. It's beaten perfectly. Everything is utilized in its exact way, and that's why one cannot make a menorah today. We don't have the ability, the skill, the, the wisdom. Move on to verse 32. We talked about a branch. Now he tells us that there's six branches that go forth from its side. Three branches from the, of the manure from one side and three branches of the manure from the second side. Now, this is very important because according to tradition that the manure was not curved, but as you can see perhaps from a picture, that is more of a V being made and that these V relate to one. The second and the third, this is going to be more clear in a moment. So we have these six branches, three on one side, three on the other, but they're uniquely connected together. It says, look now to, to verse 33. And also we have three cups, meshukadim. What's that? Well, the word shked is amen. Shkadim. Almonds. And this word tells us that, that these bowls that, that probably are related to decorative, perhaps having to do with the, the oil. Some say absolutely not. I'm not an expert in this. But what we know is that, that they are some way made to resemble almonds. And we find that, that three cups made in the appearance of almonds on one branch, also a button. This is the word kaftor. Kaftor is a button. It can be cufflinks, many different things. And you can see here what it might be from the picture that, that is being shown. So we have a, a button and also a decorative perach. A perach is a flower. So these things, and they all have meaning. And later on, when we come to the menorah again, we'll talk more about this in greater detail. So we have three cups made like almonds in one branch. Also, a button and a flower. Thus, it should be for the six branches that go forth from the menorah. So we're told that each branch, each six of them, they all have these elements. They have a, a cup, three cups. They have a button, and they also have a flower, each one. Go now to verse 34. 34 tells us that in the menorah, and this can be with the menorah, there are four, tells us here, four cups that are of uh, almond shaped and the the buttons its buttons and its its flowers now this speaks about how specifically they should look so we have the branch but we also have down below so all of these things have to be done and if this is confusing to you it's highly confusing to me exactly how to do it but that's the point that's the message there's things here just looking at this without what see the message is very simple without the holy spirit this unique spirit that was in betzael we could never do it just the typical person even one who's born again with the holy spirit it is difficult to discern 
That's why those who say, well, we're just going to make the temple right now and we can do this. No, no, and no. There's got to be revelation provided to do just that. Look now to verse 35. The, the kaftor, the button underneath two of the branches. And then it says from it. It's made from it. And a, a button underneath two of the branches from it, meaning it's made from it. It's all together. And finally it says the same thing. A button underneath two of the branches from it. For six branches go forth from the menorah. So we see here how, and this goes to support what I said earlier, there is six branches, but he talks about two. And what's underneath the two, the two would be here and how they're put together in a unique way. Do you understand how to make it? Probably not. But Betsael and others were used, uniquely called to this, this task. Verse 36. And their buttons and their branches from it. Now this mimena is telling us it's all from the same substance. They shall be, all of it, beaten of one pure gold. So now we have the clearest definition. It says all of these, the cups, the, the buttons, the flowers, the, the branches, the base, everything, everything is beaten from one lump of pure gold. It's all made from it. That's what it's trying to say. Verse 37. And you shall make the, and now we have the word, narot. Narot is where, where the light comes from. In my opinion, this is where the oil is uniquely located. So the, the cups, although some see it differently, the cups hold the nair. The nair is the, the candle. Now, this is all oil, but in modern Hebrew, a nair is a candle. But it can also simply be where the oil is. So when we look at this in clear detail, we're told, and you shall make seven narot for it. Seven places where the oil is kept and it can be illuminated. Why do I say that? Keep reading in verse 37. And shall go up, this is a word for kindling the light, lighting it, but in, in, in ancient Hebrew, it is to make the flame go up of the the lights in order to do what in order to illuminate our ever panea beyond beyond its face meaning this that the light of the menorah goes beyond its face meaning it's just not around it normally when you have a a light the light is around the source of the light what it's telling us is that this is unique and it goes beyond its source. It goes beyond where the menorah is. And that's why the tradition based upon this verse is, no matter where you would go, if it was nighttime, wherever you would go in Jerusalem, the light of the menorah, not a huge, not a huge uh, uh, vessel, but nevertheless, it would light up the whole city. You could see the light beyond its its place. Verse 38. Two other things are used here. We have its tongs. Now, this is probably for, for dealing with the, the, the wick. When you light the menorah, and then you have, then you have also the, the extinguish cups. This would be to extinguish, extinguish the, the light in the morning. So you have these two things, the tongs and the extinguishing cups. They also are made of pure gold. Verse 39. Now, I use the word gush. Gush is a lump. 
But here we have a different word. It says kikar. Now that's a measurement, a talent. Talent is an old English word for a measurement. A talent of pure gold will be made it. It should be made with it. And all of these vessels. Now, the last verse that we're going to deal with is really where a great piece of the wisdom is. Because this has to be made, but notice what he says here. And I want to read the Hebrew. Ur e ve ve tafnitam. Look and do with their pattern. So they get a pattern. We don't have that. They get a pattern from heaven of how it looked in the heaven. They get to see that. And who gets to see it? Well, it is Moses. Why do I know that? A share a ta, which you, and the you here is Moses, which you, and then the next word is mar a. Mar a is a word for appearance. So, which you, and the implication is, you saw its appearance. Where did he see this appearance? Well, what's the last word in the text? Bahar. What's the word Bahar? We look here. Bahar is on the mountain. What mountain? Mount Sinai. So we see a very strong statement of revelation being connected to worship. We also see Moses receiving this revelation. He gets the appearance of it for him to share that revelation and carry out the work. This is all to put a degree of authority upon revelation and how Moses received from God and gave faithfully, accurately, correctly to those who carried things out. And one of the implications of that is that we can rest assured that the Holy Bible, the Scripture, is indeed accurate revelation from God, perfect revelation without air. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>